Hey everyone, it's been a crazy week, and we want to start off to say that if anyone watching is still without heat or power, please contact us at info at springcreekchurch.org. We're not entirely sure what we can do to help yet, but if there's one good thing that's come from this winter storm, it's been the way that neighbors and friends have risen up to take care of each other. And we've always said here at Spring Creek that life change happens in community. And this week we've seen it play out before our eyes. We also want you to know that there are ways that you can affect even the strangers in your community. We have a list of community partners like Good Sam's of Garland and Hope Store on our website for you to connect with. We even have a blood drive next Sunday at our Garland campus from nine o'clock to 1 p.m. And if you're new around here and you just wanna find out more of what this church is about, simply text the word new, the word new to 96995. Yeah, and last week, Pastor Keith talked about our behaviors around money and what that tells us about ourselves. We also talked about the blessing that comes when you put God first in your finances and how the concept of giving 10% is something that comes first as an act of sacrifice. If you want to watch last week's sermon, check it out on our YouTube channel. And if you want to begin to give of your first fruits, know that we have three simple ways to give. You can mail in your offering to our address or go online to sprinklychurch.org slash give. But the easiest way is by pulling out your phone and texting the word give to 96995. And as always, thank you for your generosity. Hey, and the last thing we want to touch base with you on before worship is to let you know that we believe in the power of prayer. We want you to know that the leaders of this church are in constant prayer for you, especially in weeks like this. And if you have something specific you want us to pray with you for, text the word prayer to 96995. Hey, we love you guys. We hope you guys are staying safe, stay warm, and let's worship the Lord this morning. Good morning, Spring Creek Online. We are so glad that you are here to worship with us. We have a new song for you, and I hope that you will connect with the words that we're singing this morning and give Jesus glory today. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested, my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given
Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoices though heaven and lost. But then Jesus arose with the freedom in That's when death was away. Matthew 24, 35 says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by no means will pass away. God's counsel and faithfulness and all of his promises are the same today as they were at the beginning and creation of the world. You can see from the very beginning of the Bible through the very end that God always had a plan to bring Jesus into the world for our salvation. And there are so many promises in between that are just as true today as they were then. So this morning, let's celebrate a God who is faithful to his promises.
I'll still bless you. Well, this has been quite the week, hasn't it? I know a lot of you have, uh, like we ourselves, uh, have just seen your, your, your neighbors, your friends, and maybe even yourself. You've gone through times without power, without heat. Uh, maybe you've had pipes freeze in your house. We know a lot of our families have been affected. We've been praying for everybody, even tried to open up the church as a shelter for a period of time, only to lose power here in the middle of the night and have to close down as a shelter. Uh, it looks like we're finally beginning to roll out of those problems and power is being restored, except in a few of our neighbors' situations, but the loss of life has just been terrible, and the, the things that people have had to endure. I'm so grateful that I've seen uh, throughout the week many of you coming together, uh, offering your homes, opening your homes to neighbors, to friends, to family, to help people out during this time. That's being the church, and I couldn't be more proud of Spring Creek and how you've made a stand like that. We're going to begin a brand new series today called The Age of Rage. Before we get started, would you just bow your heads with me and let's pray together. Father, we are so incredibly grateful that we have this opportunity now to gather in your presence. Thankful for this time of worship that we've had. Thank you now, God, that we have this time to worship around your word. We know you're already here in a powerful way and you're going to be with us during this time. I pray for those families who've lost loved ones uh, during this past week. I pray, God, for them in their grief, uh, for them in their anger, uh, for them in all the concerns about what's gone wrong uh, in our state. And I pray, God, that you would speed answers. But more importantly, God, I pray that you would speed your comfort and your healing to their life. God, I pray that we will continue to be conscious of the needs of our neighbors to do anything and everything we can to reach out and help during this time. And I would ask God that as we now begin to look at your word and what it has to say about anger, that Lord, you will open up our hearts and cause us to look inside and examine honestly where we stand in managing our anger. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I really sincerely believe we're living in an anger incubator. Uh, with all the stress of this pandemic, the financial burdens brought on by job loss and our unstable economy, living through a hotly contested election and everything that went along with that, the riots during the summer, the attempted insurrection at the Capitol in January, and then couple that now with the anger over what's gone on with the power grid in the state of Texas, it truly has been an ideal environment for anger to rise to unprecedented levels. That's really what an incubator does. It provides the ideal environment for things to grow. You and I have been fed a steady diet of outrage for the past year now. We feed off it through various news sites. It's all over Twitter and Facebook. Some of you have seen people that you love and care about deeply transform and twist into something you no longer recognize. They now go around angry all the time. They seem to walk around with a chip on their shoulder. And you wonder sincerely, is there anything left of the person that I once knew? Someone has called anger the cocaine of the emotions because it's so extremely addictive. The more you give into it, the more of it you must have. And just like cocaine, you and I will eventually be destroyed by it. But I need to add quickly that anger is also sometimes the most appropriate response to a given situation. Sometimes it's the right response, at other times, especially when it comes down to how we express it, it can be totally wrong. Today, we're going to discover the difference. So one of the main reasons we know anger is not sinful is because God himself gets angry. He's described as being slow to anger, but we know that eventually God himself sometimes gets angry. So anger is not necessarily sinful, but it can lead to sin. 
In this way, it doesn't fall quite into the same category as other sins. Most sins need to be overcome, but anger is one of those things that needs to be managed. We never talk about managing lust or greed or envy. We're just supposed to get rid of them. We're told to purge them from our life. But anger is one of the things we have to learn to control. We have to learn it, learn to express it in the right way, in ways that honor God and honor other people. Think about it like this. Other sins are also largely internal. Things like lust and envy and greed, we can have those in our spirit and carry them in our heart for years without people being aware of that. But when we're angry, it shows. We raise our voice. Our our faces turn red. There's an edge to everything we're saying. In other words, it's clear we're mad. What I'm saying is, is anger is almost always obvious. Chances are most of us can look back over the past week or past month and think of a time or two or three when we got angry and it was hurtful. Uh, Maybe it was on the job, maybe with our kids, maybe with our spouse, or maybe in our morning or evening commute. Anger also happens to be one of the first manifestations of sin in Scripture. In Genesis 4, Cain becomes angry with his brother, attacks and kills him. We're going to look at this sin in particular next week, so be with us next week so you can hear more about this particular dynamic and how it played out. But the first display of anger we see in Scripture happens in the home between members of the same family. But it begs this question, doesn't it? Why is it that we seem to get most angry at people we're closest to? Maybe it's because we spend so much time together. Maybe it's because we have so much more invested in those relationships. And so our expectations ride a lot higher. And when those expectations get frustrated, our anger tends to manifest. But regardless of how we answer that question, it really is, no. there's no doubt, we get angry at those that we are closest to. Now, I don't know about you, but I have this growing level of uneasiness about the level of anger and vitriol in our country. There's anger about politics. There's anger about the economy, about racism, sexism, classism. classism. There's anger about the virus, and there's angry about the management of our power grid right here in Texas. I'm not saying that those things shouldn't produce anger. Anger seems to be a very appropriate response, but everything comes down to how we express it. Our world is addicted to rage. It has become its own pandemic. And just so you know, anger is not a problem that's just happening out there. It's happening in here, in the church, and it's happening in here, in our hearts. It infects and affects us all. So let's begin with the question, is there anything good about anger? Believe it or not, anger can be a form of love. Anger is love trying to protect the thing we care about the most. I mean, think about Jesus and the cleansing of the temple. Unlike a lot of our angry behavior, which is often spontaneous and ill-conceived, Jesus was very deliberate when he entered the temple and cleansed it. He was disrupting a corrupt temple system of exploitation. It was his love manifesting for the poor who are being fleeced daily at the temple grounds. And by the way, if you read this passage carefully and grammatically, it doesn't say that Jesus fashioned a whip to use on people. The whip he was, that he made was used to drive the animal from the temple courts. Jesus' anger was righteous. It was disruptive, and it was purposeful. So what about God's anger? How can we describe it? Well, as I see it, there are at least three characteristics to God's anger. Number one is God's anger is just. Whenever God gets angry, he always has a good reason for it. His wrath is never provoked by selfish feelings, petty emotions, or the honest mistake of other people. God's wrath could be described or never be described as being arbitrary or capricious. If you're familiar with the mythologies of ancient literature, you know that the gods in those accounts could get angry with people for the silliest of reasons, like because of their good looks or talents or popularities, or they just might take an instant disliking to someone. That's the way mythology reads. But the God of the Bible is never like that. Instead, we see God's anger manifested most frequently in how the world treats the most vulnerable members of society. God's anger could be described as a protective anger. 
So he gets angry at people who hoard wealth, who corrupt justice, or who economically exploit the poor and the powerless. That's something we see a lot of in the Bible from cover to cover. God's anger is also kindled against false teachers who would lead his sheep astray. So God's anger is just because it's always based on a thorough knowledge of the truth of any given situation. And that is so unlike us. It's extremely rare that any of us knows the whole truth about any situation. But that doesn't stop us from getting angry, does it? We assume we know all there is to know. And what details we don't know, we can fill in with whatever best suits our theory of what's actually happening. I call this the great lie. The great lie that accompanies anger is that we do know the whole story. This is what makes us feel justified in hanging on to our anger because we tell ourselves, if you knew what was really going on, if you knew what I know, you'd be angry too. We think we know the whole truth when really only God does. We can't even see how our own emotional investment in the situation or our point of view might be coloring our perception. So we think I'm 100% right and you're just 100% wrong. Now, it is possible that that's the case, but let's be honest, that really seldom is the case. It reminds me of something John Ortberg once said, it is possible to be so caught up in the joy of being right, in the thrilling sense of being morally superior to those who are not right, that you become more wrong than your most degraded opponent. So it's possible to be totally right in your assessment of a situation, but to become totally wrong by the way you handle that situation. A second factor to God's anger is this. God's anger is slow to heat up. Now, I often hear people portray God of the Old Testament as a vindictive old grouch who delights in nothing more than punishing people for the slightest of offenses. Whenever I hear someone say that, I realize they've never really read or particularly studied the Old Testament. Typically, they're quoting some verse out of context or some verse without uh, a more thorough knowledge of, of the context of what's going on in that particular chapter, or they're just parroting what they've heard other people say. If you actually read the Old Testament, what you discover is time and time again how incredibly patient and long-suffering God is. You know, we did a series on the book of Genesis, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which contains a lot of the judgments that are found in that book. And what we discovered again and again as we studied that is God's warnings were repeated hundreds of times and over hundreds of years. God always led with grace. He always attempted to steer his people toward a better options. God's anger is and always has been slow to heat up. But is our anger slow to be aroused? Not usually. Sometimes we actually look, go around looking for things to be upset about. We become grievance collectors. We choose to believe the worst about people's motives and choose to interpret their words or their actions in the most offensive way possible just to justify being angry with them. The third quality to God's anger is this. God's anger is quick to dissipate. You know, when we act out in anger, we often stew on it, ruminate on it, and refuse to let it go. But God is exactly the opposite. It takes God forever to get angry. And once he does, he gets over it quickly and then he moves on. It never lingers. He doesn't hold grudges. He has no long-term relationship with the pain that was caused him. Instead, God's use of anger is for restoring broken relationship. He, he, he never lets it settle in for the long, the long haul. In fact, the best way to say it is God designed anger to have a short shelf life. The longer you hang on to it, the more it spoils, the worse it gets, and the more toxic your own spirit becomes. I love the way retired four-star general Colin Powell said it, get mad, then get over it. That's really good advice. So let's shift gears a minute and let's talk about when anger crosses the line and becomes destructive. Listen to Paul explain. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. God does not encourage us to engage in anger, rage, or malice. Instead, we're told to take them off like you would dirty clothes. 
James tells us human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. This verse is reminding us that our anger does not work in the same way God's anger does. We are less likely to produce a right result through our anger when we're mad, which means we have to be very careful with anger. We don't have a good track record with it. Aristotle once wisely observed, anyone can become angry. That is easy. But to be angry with the right person, to the right degree, at the right time, and for the right purpose, and in the right way, that is not easy. You see, sin has perverted this righteous and protective impulse of anger that God has and has twisted it into a weapon of assault to be used against people when we feel threatened, when there's actually no threat. This is something Eugene Peterson was alluding to when he said, wrath virtually always feels righteous, which of course is why it's so dangerous. It's easy for me to turn my anger into a righteous cause when it's not. Even Benjamin Franklin weighed in on this. He said, anger is never without reason, but seldom with a good one. In other words, if you want to find a reason to justify your anger, you can always find it. It's the selfish bent of sin that has perverted anger into what it is. And it gets perverted by this sense of all-consuming self-interest that we have. Day in, day out. I mean, think about this. What makes Americans most angry? Is it ISIS? Abortion? Is it human trafficking? No, it's nothing like that. It's traffic jams. It's when the zipper gets stuck on my new coat. It's when the person at Wendy's behind the counter gets my order incorrect. It's when people don't notice the hard work I'm doing. Most of our anger happens because we're blinded by our all-consuming self-interest. That if it's not happening right now, if it's not happening the way I want it to happen, if it's not serving me, then my temper flares. We need to ask ourselves honestly, in what ways have I made this situation totally about me? It's because of this self-serving anger that we refuse to see the damage that our anger is actually doing. How we may be killing our witness for Christ, how we're estranging people in our life who care about us incredibly, how we may be increasing our own blood pressure, how we're stressing our heart, we're robbing ourselves of peace of mind. Uh, There's this excellent book called Anger Kills. It was written by Robert and Virginia Williams. They said this, getting angry is like taking a small dose of some slow acting poison every day of your life. What they said is actually remarkably similar to something Mark Twain said. Acid is, or our anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. You know, even Jewish tradition in the Talmud takes a very dim view of anger. Uh, this is written there. When, an, when a man becomes angry, if he is a sage, his wisdom departs from him. If he's a prophet, his prophecy departs from him. Do you know who that passage was written about? That's written about Moses. When Moses lost his temper, the prophet said he loses his message when he loses his temper. If I'm going to be persuasive with other people, if I'm going to be an influence, then I have to learn to keep anger in check. Uh, We need to consider the interests of others. I mean, there's this great book. It was written by Lynn Truss. It's called Talk to the Hand Since the Head is Not Listening. Listen to what she wrote. This is the age of social autism in which people just do not see or even imagine their impact on others. Now, if you were to go to WebMD and look up the term autism, you would find that one of the characteristics of the autistic is a lack of empathy. In other words, those who have autism have difficulty reading someone else's feelings, and as a result, they have trouble entering into relationships with others. Well, think of angry people as kind of suffering from a form of social autism. They simply refuse to put themselves into someone else's shoes or see life from their point of view. The Bible makes this clear. If you want to have an impact on others, you've got to see life from their perspective. You've got to try to get in their shoes, get inside their skin, feel what they're feeling, experience life from their point of view. That's the virtue God encourages, the ability to take into account how other people see and experience what's happening around them. The Bible tells us we must bear the burden of being considerate of the doubts and fears of others. Or this, now, None of you should think of his own affairs, but consider other person's interests also. So that's my question. Are we in tune with the doubts, the fears, and the interests of others? Most times when relationships 
break down. It's because we're not being considerate of someone else's doubts and fears and interests. So to be a part of the solution, we have to change our focus. Something else, anger is one of those emotions that likes to hide. To do business with anger, you have to first recognize it in one of its many forms. And that's what this next point is all about, recognizing the many faces of anger. Now, there's this great book called The Anger Trap. It was written by Les Carter. He's a Christian psychologist, and he helps us understand that anger likes to wear a lot of disguises. It likes to hide. It likes to create a sense of deniability where I can say, I'm not mad, even when inside I'm a seething volcano. So the first type of anger he talks about is what he calls suppressed anger. This is withdrawing from anger. This is not saying anything. This is allowing anger to do a slow burn inside of you. That's suppressed anger. The problem with suppressed anger is that anger is energy and does not like to be suppressed. If you don't get that energy out, if you don't get that anger out by talking it out, then you take it out. You take it out on yourself in terms of high blood pressure, heart problems, stress, inability to sleep, or you take it out on other people. Now, for years, I have to confess, this was my preferred way of dealing with anger, pushing it down, not dealing with it, disowning how angry I really was. But in my experience, stuffing down anger is like overfilling a water balloon. You know what? Sooner or later, that thing's going to burst. Somewhere, sometime, in ways you can't predict, it's all going to come gushing out. And that's the way my anger became. Repressed anger is extremely destructive because it becomes so unpredictable. Now, the very first therapist I ever had that I met with for a good two years every week was a specialist in anger therapy. And he helped me see that I was storing up anger that I was treating it kind of like water behind a great dam. All of my past injuries and hurts, every time I felt slighted, uh, pained by others, suffered an injustice, I just kind of put that behind the dam. And that water began to build up and build up until eventually it was at flood stage. And you know, when you get flood stage behind a dam, you got to open up you got to open those doors so that the water can flow. And so what would happen is this is all of that pain behind my reservoir. You did not want to be the person who was on the receiving end of that pain because if you did anything even remotely like what had been done to me in the past, I'd open up the floodgates and I'd let you have it. And sadly, the person who got the most of that was my wife, Brenda. So my first therapist began to help me see what I was actually doing. Whenever Brenda did anything even remotely like what had been done to me in the past, I opened the floodgates and I let that anger go on her. I released it onto her. And he told me, here's the telltale sign that you're doing that. Anytime your anger is bigger than the moment calls for, you are definitely combining new anger with old anger. So you open the floodgates to release the pressure that's been constantly building. After you blow up, you feel a lot better because that pressure has been released, but everybody else in your life feels a lot worse. They feel worse because you treated them like they were responsible for all of your pain. The second thing he helped me to do was empty that reservoir. You see, all that stuff behind the dam was the stuff I was refusing to face. It was every time I was hurt and I swallowed it rather than say something. I had the right anger. I was choosing the wrong battlefield. And this is why we have to face the hurts of our past, because the unresolved past simply doesn't go away on its own. It goes underground, you lose conscious connection with it, and then it takes over the driver's seat of your life. We become an open wound, overreacting to anybody who happens to touch us at the point of the wound. The only way to change is to face our hurts, to grieve our hurts, to forgive our hurts, and to release them to God, because that's where we're freed up, to relate to people as they really are and not connect them with everything that's ever been done wrong to ourselves. A second type of anger is openly aggressive anger. This is anger that's just out there for the world to see. It can be rude, it can be abrasive, it can be contentious, and it can be abusive. The best word to describe this kind of anger is malice. Bill Hendrickson, who's an excellent Bible scholar, explained malice in the Bible like this. Malice is the in evil inclination of mind that even takes delight in inflicting hurt or injury on one's fellow man. Think of it like this. Malice is anger gone sour. In the Bible, the Greek word for it is kakotheia. 
And it comes from kakos, which means evil, and ethos, which means disposition. It's talking about those who read the worst motives onto everybody else in their life. They, they, they give a malicious interpretation to what other people are doing. Now, if you're married to someone like this or you have a family member who's like this, let me just tell you right up front, it will not change on its own. Now, remember, because I've said this on numerous occasions, human beings cannot look into the heart and really know what motivates other people. That is something the Bible says only God himself can do. God can see in the heart. God can see why we do what we do. Satan likes to pretend to know that. He doesn't know it because he can't see the heart like God can. He can't read our minds. And so he likes to play this guessing game, and he loves to accuse our motives. This is the method we see in Scripture, Old Testament and New. New, He is the slanderer. He's the one who's constantly accusing our motives. So when people tell you that they know the motives of other people, not only are they trying to play God, but they are also, you should see what they're saying as confession. Because you see, the only motives we really have access to are our our own. And so when I look at someone else's motives and I say, hey, I know what's motivating them, what I'm really saying is if I were in that situation, this is why I would be doing those things. It is a confession of the wickedness of their own heart. Now listen to these biblical scholars describe malice. Malice is a disposition to take everything in the worst sense. Or William Barclay, the spirit, malice is the spirit which puts the worst construction on everything. Now, once you understand what malice is, you can see this throughout the pages of the Bible. There's just tons of examples of malice in Scripture. Cain toward Abel, Sarah toward Hagar, Esau toward Jacob, Joseph's brother toward Joseph, uh, Potiphar's wife toward Joseph, Saul toward David, Jezebel toward Elijah, the Samaritans toward the Jews and vice versa, Herodias toward John, Herod toward Jesus, and Jews toward Jesus. The third face of anger is what we call passive-aggressive anger. This is an anger that's more subtle. It's often hidden. Uh, If you're passive-aggressive angry, sometimes you do what people ask you to do, but you do it slowly or you do it on your own terms and not theirs. In other words, your anger comes out in a passive kind of way. This is a favorite mode of Christians to express their anger. And the reason they love it so much is because it is one of those things that it's really hard to pin someone down who's being passive aggressively angry. It's one of those things that you can't know their heart, you can't know why they're doing what they're doing, but they do it so much and so frequently, you know it's their anger coming out sideways. And by the way, you should just know this right up front. God goes on the record as saying, I hate this kind of of anger the most. Hatred is a part of the makeup of God. It's totally correct to say God doesn't hate people because he doesn't. But God hates sin, and he hates sin because of what it does to the people he loves. In addition, God doesn't ask us to play mind games with him or be mind readers when it comes to the things that makes him angry. He tells us the things he despises. He tells us that in many places, and he tells us very explicitly in the book of Proverbs. So Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 19, this is what the scriptures say. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, Feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. So there's this formula in this verse that you see in the book of Proverbs and other places in the Old Testament. It is simply called the N, N plus one formula. So when Solomon writes, there are six things God hates, seven that are detestable to him, that's the formula. Six, and then six plus one is seven. And then later in chapter 30 of Proverbs, Solomon said, there are three things that amaze me, four things I don't understand. That's the N, N plus one formula. In the book of Amos, the prophet Amos says, for the three sins of Tyre and for four, I will not turn my back. That's again, N, N plus one. This is a very Jewish way of writing, and it's a way Jewish people put the emphasis on the last thing they said. The way we would say it, this is the straw that broke the camel's back, or we say the last straw. God says, I hate six things, but seven are abomination to me. So what he's saying is the seventh thing takes the cake. The seventh thing is the thing that grinds his gears. And you want to know what makes God really mad? It's the person who stirs up dissension in the family of God. 
the one who sows discord, the people who are being divisive. That's a behavior God hates most of all. Why? It's passive aggressive behavior. Rather than come to the person with whom you have a problem, you go to everybody else. So Solomon is saying, you want a snapshot of the person who sows discord? It's all these other things. They're full of pride. They spread lies. They attack innocent victims. They're at the heart of every controversy. So let's read the verse again in light of that. All these qualities lead up to the last. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. Do you notice anything unusual in that past? As we read it through that time, you might have noticed that this is a little mini anatomy lesson. It's their haughty eyes. It's their lying tongues. It's their hands that are guilty. It's their heart that devises wicked things. It's their feet that carry them to mischief and their mouth that spreads lies. What Solomon is saying is this person is totally into it. You see, it's not just their mouth. It's their eyes, their tongue, their feet, their hands, their heart, and their mouth. It's everything about them that is totally into gossip and tearing other people down. And God says, I hate that behavior most of all. And by the way, there's a second part to this sin, and that's the person who listens to it or takes it in. Because Solomon writes just a little later, a wicked man listens to evil lips, a liar pays attention to a malicious tongue. You know, there are laws that govern our nation that say that if you accept stolen goods, you're as guilty as the person who stole it. Well, God says, if you listen to gossip, if you listen to other people tear others down, then you're just as guilty as the person who's spreading it. You see, gossip is just one of those things that wouldn't exist without passive recipients. Without them, the antagonist efforts would fail because they don't have the courage on their own to go and deal with it in the right way. They need sympathizers. They need followers in order to keep up their campaign. It was Cicero who once said there are two kinds of injustice. The first is found in those who do an injury. The second in those who fail to protect another from injury when they can so when you just sit by and passively listen to someone destroy or assassinate someone else's character, you become a part of the problem. This is passive aggressive anger. It's not just the person who enjoys spreading dissension, it's the person who listens to it too, who won't be confrontational, who won't be direct about their anger because God understands how insidious and destructive this sin is. So what do we do? I mean, is there any hope? Is there any help? Well, there is, and God's remedy is patience. Now, I told you, earlier, that one of the things that makes God's anger distinctive from our anger is that it takes him a long time to get angry. Notice Exodus 34, 6, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger. By the way, this is a verse that's repeated like nine times verbatim in the Old Testament and alluded to many other times. God is slow to anger. You can't talk about anger without talking about patience because that's what patience is. It's slow to get angry. Literally, in the Bible, the Greek word for patience is makrothumos. Makro means long or slow, and thumos means heat. In other words, a person who's patient is slow to heat up. They have a long fuse. They don't boil over quickly because they're patient. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but God doesn't have to try to be patient. He just is. He never has to bite his tongue. He never has to restrain his emotions. He simply bears with his children through thick and through thin. Now, I'm not saying that God never gets angry because he most certainly does, but in his anger, he never misinterprets a situation. He never feels threatened. He never loses control. Why does God have this immense capacity for patience? Well, first and foremost, because of his immense love for us, but also because he has a unique perspective on time. Think about it. The reason we often lose our patience is because of the tick of the clock. You're on your way to work, you're stuck in traffic, you know you have to be at the office by eight, and all these idiots around you can't drive. Why do you get mad? Because you're up against the ticking of the clock. You're working with your child at night, you're trying to help them with their homework. You had something else planned besides doing remedial math all night long, and it's taking them forever to get it. You get angry because you feel the tick of the clock. You wanted to do something else with your time. But God never feels the pressure of time. Look at this verse. Patience, you've got all the time in the world, whether a thousand years or a day, it's all the same to you. So God has immense patience because he has all the time in the world. So time is a factor in our patience, but so is understanding. 
we don't see the whole story. Listen to this. A patient man has great understanding. So if you're a person with patience, it's because you're very understanding. The more you understand another person, the more patient you are. The more you take in the larger reality of what's going on, their hurts, their fears, their interests, the less inclined you will be to heat up or lash out or say things before thinking. The Bible reminds us a man's wisdom gives him patience. It is his glory to overlook and offense. Patience is this ability to absorb the big and small irritants and injustices of life without letting it tank your spirit or overwhelm you with anger. It takes patience to overlook an offense. I used to work at a grocery store in Nashville, Tennessee called H.G. Hill Company. There was a guy I worked with. His name was Jimmy. To call him a jerk would be an insult to jerks all across the world. Jimmy was a world-class jerk. Jimmy was smart-alecky. Jimmy always did his job, but did it as slowly as possible. He always had an attitude. I was a stockman like Jimmy was, so I had no power over him. I couldn't do anything about his problems. All I did was stew about how about how angry I was with him all the time. So I started to talk to Jimmy about Jimmy, and I found out that he was a recovering alcoholic. I found out that he had two small girls at home and he was struggling to make ends meet. I found out that Jimmy had just recently been released from prison and only recently became a Christian. Now, over the next several weeks, nothing changed in Jimmy, but everything began changing in me. I found myself, instead of saying, you know, look at how far he's got to go, I found myself saying, Look at how far he's come. And every time I heard something smart coming out of Jimmy's mouth, you know, something smart alecky, I, I began to think, I wonder how many times as a kid he heard his dad or his mom say that to him. You see, beneath that behavior, there were some real wounds, some real pains. And when I got a glimpse of the hurt, the fears, and the interest behind Jimmy, I became much more compassionate and patient with him. But here's the best part of all. May God give May God, who gives patience. Patience is a gift. It's a gift from God. The level of patience you have is largely going to be dependent on the level and depth of your relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, we've just begun this season of Lent, the 40 days leading up to Easter. I don't know if you participate in this Christian tradition or not, but I do want to encourage you to do it. Even though you didn't start this past Wednesday, which was Ash Wednesday, that's fine. Begin today, begin in the spirit of Lent. So just a couple of weeks ago, we talked about spiritual disciplines how that spiritual disciplines are not an end in itself. We don't engage in the spiritual discipline of solitude so that we get really good at being alone. We don't engage in the spiritual discipline of stewardship so that we become great accountants. The spiritual disciplines have an indirect effect on our spiritual life. Lent is a time of extended spiritual discipline with fasting. Fasting is not intended to make you really good at going without food. We don't do it to lose weight. We don't, prove, we don't do it to prove to ourselves that we can go without a meal or without our favorite food. The reason we fast is because fasting reveals the things that control us. I mean, think about it. How often have we used food to cover up what's really going on inside of us? When we fast, those things come to the surface. Listen to Richard Foster explain. Anger, bitterness, jealousy, strife, fear, if they're within us, they'll surface during fasting. Now, it's not by accident that Foster mentions first, when talking about fasting, anger, because this is typically the first emotion we experience when we're fasting. We get grumpy. We get short with people. We snap at people over small things. We tell ourselves it's because we're hungry. But could it be that we're actually covering up an undercurrent of anger in our life that we have covered up with alcohol, with cigarettes, with ice cream, McDonald's, Starbucks, or Cinnabon. If you fast during Lent, the spiritual purpose is, number one, in preparation for Easter, but the spiritual purpose is so that God might reveal the things inside of us with which we've lost contact that are controlling us. Because you see, behind every anger, there's a hurt, there's a fear, there's a frustration. And God wants those things to surface because you see in the dark and at the unconscious level, they have power. The power of sin is in its secrecy. The more it remains hidden, the more powerful it is in your life. But when you fast, what is hidden comes out into the light, comes into the broadness of the day, comes out into the light where God can heal it and forgive it and you can release it. This is why we fast so that we can become more conscious of the things that control us. So I'm going to encourage you today to to take this to heart, 
to understand how important patience is that we have this fuller perspective of the people in our life and what's really going on, that we take the time to put our own spirit and self-interest in check to, to, to invest ourselves in the story of other people so that we know the whole story, so that we can receive from God the patience he has for us and that we can do business with the stuff that is remaining beneath the surface that is hidden. And we do that through fasting and allowing God to bring it out into the light. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time we've had together. Thank you for how precious this time of Lent is uh, to your servants, your people who practice it. It is a time, God, where we do business with you about the things that we have been neglecting, about the things that we've stuffed down, about the things that we've lost contact with. We want to release our past hurts. We want to release every injustice. We want to release our grievances. We want to release malice. We want to release our anger. So God, allow those things to surface in our life so that we can bring them to you, the only one who has the capacity to heal and to forgive and to set us free so that we are fully living in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, for what you're doing through this time that we've had together. We pray, God, you'll continue that work as we continue to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. So grateful that you would choose to join us today. Again, if you like this message, share this message, share it through your social me media channels. We're going to post after this message some discussion questions. So if in your small group or just alone, you'd like to have some time to work through some of the implications of today's message, then take a few moments this week to contemplate those, to uh, think about your answers to them and to bring them before the Lord. God bless you. Have a great week.